Hey guys, Philip Shaler here, your local real estate agent in Los Angeles. And today I want to talk about how to sell an overpriced listing or how I sold an overpriced listing. It seems to be a very common occurrence for homeowners to overprice their properties. And let's have a look at it real quick here on this uh, screen here. 75% of sellers are overpricing their homes. Here is how that could backfire on you. You may be eager to command as high a sales price as possible for your home. Being too greedy could come back to haunt you. If you price your home too high, it could sit on the market. You could have to drop your price later. Now, these are just some of the pitfalls, some of the downfalls of overpricing your house. Now, sellers seem to have that mindset, you know, let's start really high and let's just wait and see and waste this time and see if nothing comes in, we can always drop our price. Well, here is why I think this is a detrimental mistake. The first three to four weeks in the listing period is like the prime time. This is like the honeymoon phase, but this is where all of the results of the marketing efforts of the realtor show up. This is where the biggest excitement is created by the realtor with holding open houses, with uh, social media postings. This is also, by the way, historically seen, the uh, time span where the highest offers come in, the first three to four weeks, right? And also realtors have the opportunity to submit the listing to hundreds of syndicated websites across the country. So this is really where it's happening, right? This is the prime time. If you price yourself too high, you miss that prime time and you're putting yourself in the back two, three, four months, right? What I mean is if you have a four months uh, listing uh, agreement, you're going to be close and expired or you're going to have to take a low ball offer because you missed that momentum, that fun, that, that, that prime time. Now, um, with, with my seller, and I, I'm not knocking her, I absolutely adore her. She was absolutely great to work with, very fast responder, you know, with text and email, really great to communicate. It was a great experience with her. However, she's a first-time home seller, so it's easy to fall into an uh, overpricing trap. But she really put, you know, a lot of effort into the place, like made the place sparkle. I always ask people on the phone, um, how would you rate your property's condition from zero to 10, 10 being the best? You know, this was definitely a 10, you know. Now... We're going to talk about there. There's two reasons really why uh, homeowners overprice their property. One we're going to talk about now, and the other reason we talk about later in the video. This way, you stick around for the end. Sellers get input from friends, family members. Maybe they have somebody who used to be a realtor, and they all tell them, "Don't undersell your house. Make sure you charge top dollar." You know, and then also, of course, Zillow's estimate comes into the game. You know, which doesn't help at all. And I want to share something with, with you quickly. So first of all, I want you to know we had a market of 72 DOMs. So on average, it takes, it took, at that particular time, it took 72 days to sell a property in the greater Los Angeles area. Now, Zillow, before we went live, this is a two-bedroom, four-bath, 1,275 square foot townhouse in North Hills. Zillow states it's worth 529500 The moment we went live, literally within 24 hours, this changed to this, 582500 right? That's a big jump. So my seller comes up to me and says, I want to list my place for 599000 I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Seller, I cannot take the listing at that price. It's way overpriced. The market won't support that price tag. You know, I, I, I don't have any expires. All my listings have sold so far, so I, I just wouldn't make sense. Then she said, okay, how about 585000 I said, even at 585000 we're overpriced. You know, I wish I could tell you yes, but based on the data I provided for my seller, which is this one here, it's known as a CMA, a comparative market analysis. So here I go and check the neighborhood, uh, half mile radius, quarter mile radius, whatever it takes to find comparable uh, properties that are similar in size and features. And then the seller can look at this and hopefully would use this to incorporate it, that, that uh, data into the pricing strategy. Like for example, here is a place that's across the way that's sold on September 25th, 2023 for $525,000, right? So. The most important data in this document is this right here. This is hard data. This is data you can bank on. This has closed escrow. This has sold. This here, active listing, is dreamland. You know, anybody can come up with a price. We don't know if the pricing was done properly. So this hasn't sold it. This is not data we can go by. However, based on the information on this CMA, on this comparative market analysis, we came up with a listing price range of 515000 to five thirty-five. right? Now, um, the seller says to me, <laughs> remember, I just told the seller it won't sell at 585. At some point, the seller came to me and says, how about 555,000? I said, well, we're still overpriced a little bit, 10 to $15,000, but I can work with it. And I didn't want to push it too far here. And so 
Of course, the seller says, you know, to me, she saw this sheet and says, uh, well, wait a minute, but the seller says, seller says right here, I see it in black and white. It says, my place is worth 582500 You know, I said, well, I was trying to explain the Zillow thing, and it was really difficult. Oftentimes, it's very difficult. People go by what the Zillow's estimate is. But here, I want you to check this out really quick, because this is something I found, and I think it's very valuable and very interesting. Have a look. Zillow Group CEO Spencer Raskoff is here with us. Welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be so here. So just for everybody who doesn't know how Zillow works, what is the Zestimate that you provide? <laughs> the Zestimate is Zillow's computer model's opinion of what every home in the country is worth. So you can see uh, what the Zestimate is for any home, for your home, for my home, for your neighbor's home. And, and that type of information empowers consumers. It helps people make smarter decisions. And what goes into that calculation? A whole lot of math. Uh, so uh, when we started about 10 years ago, uh, Zestimates had about a 14% error rate, and we calculated them monthly on about half the country. Today, Zestimates have about a 5% error rate. We calculate them real time, instantaneously, on the entire country. So well, another question would come to mind here. I said, why does Zillow err on the upside, not on the downside, right? Well, there is a reason for that, I would imagine. This is just my opinion. When people look at Zillow, they see that their homes are higher valued than other sources, right? So now, of course, they're going to call Zillow since Zillow has an agent referral program. They want you to basically, they're, they're, they are um, enticing you to call Zillow with the higher prices, the higher perceived value on your home so that you use their agents. And But the problem is you're going to be still disappointed because no matter what Zillow says, if it's not supported by the market, you will be disappointed. You will have to drop your price. So what Zillow's estimate said is really not accurate. Okay, so here you heard it yourself. The CEO of Zillow states that this estimate from Zillow has a 14 to 5% error rate, which is huge, right? So based on that, I went ahead and created a little data sheet for my client, which is right here. So now this Zillow's estimate says it's 582,500 minus the 5% error rate. Now, again, he said 14% was a few years ago, so we'll be fair. Uh, 5% is 29,125. Now we have a perceived value of 553,375, which interesting enough, is closer to reality, 555,000 closer to our list price, right? Now, when I took this listing, I knew, since we're a little bit overpriced, I knew I had to do a massive amount of marketing because the last thing I wanted to happen is that the seller comes up to me and says, hey, we didn't get any offers because you didn't do enough marketing, right? And I love marketing anyway. So the first thing I created for my seller was a pitch sheet, and it looks something like uh, this. This is through my uh, brokerage, EXP Realty. We're vastly represented worldwide and also in the United States. I believe we may have the highest agent count per brokerage, but don't quote me that. Anyway, at that particular time, we had over 9 million active buyers in our database. We had over 3 million active buyers at a price tag of 555000 and we had 1,244 active buyers in North Hills. We had 590 active buyers at a price tag of 550,000 in North Hills, and we were able to send this to 590 targeted buyers instantly, which produced some results, some, some lower offers, but it did produce some results. I also boosted the property all across social media, and I have different ways of doing it. One is a company that helps me that I pay, and then also I do a lot myself. So the first boost was 689 impression, 12 clicks, two leads. The second one was 587 impression, 23 clicks, eight leads. And the next one was 756 impression, 35 clicks, and 11 leads, right? I also created this marketing sheet here for my client. And interesting enough, you know, sellers sometimes are not, or sometimes are reluctant to sign a listing agreement early. I think in a slow market with 72 days on market, which is considered a slow market, I think it's wise if you want to sell your property two months from now, it would be wise to sign the listing agreement today because that allows me an ample time to ramp up excitement, to ramp up advertising, to, to let people know it's coming, right? That is really a head start in a slow market. And... Because if you allow me verbally to advertise a property and then change your mind later, we would have a lawsuit. So my broker doesn't allow it. It has to have a signed listing agreement before we can do any advertisement at all. It makes sense, right? So uh, my seller was not reluctant to sign early. We did this 11-18-2023. The first boost was to KB Court. Again, it's through my broker. It's a company that I use that I pay. Then I did my own open house announcement uh, several times. And so the first open house was December 4th, 2023. We had a total result of 21 people coming to the open house. And we had a marketing result of 12,351,000 impressions. In the first open house, 
uh, I noticed that people came in and they had affordability issues. You know, the rates were still at 7.3% or so. And remember, about three years ago, the mortgage payment for this property would have been $2,600, $2,700. And now it's $3,900. So it's jumped up quite a bit, right? There's nothing we can do about the market. It's just the way it is. But I did notice uh, affordability issues because people ask, could we make an offer at 520 or 510 or 530? And the seller instructed me 555 or more, nothing less, because she already went down from 599 to 585 to 555. She's like, I'm not giving up anymore, right? It's just the mindset. And so I told these people, don't even bother making an offer because, or writing an offer because seller will not look at it. So then we went into the second phase. We did another boost. Um, and the next boost, we had a result of 27 people coming to open house and a social media uh, impression uh, result of 23,817. 23, now at the second open house, a realtor's son came by, really liked the property. And next day, the realtor, her, his mother called me and said, would your seller be interested in a full price offer of $555,000, but the seller pays buyer's closing costs, which would have been around $7,000 at that time. Obviously, I presented it to my client. And she said, no, I'm not going to pay anything. Because remember, in her mind, she was like $599, $585, $555. I've given up so much already. It's like, I don't give up anymore. I said, okay, then we'll keep on pushing. But right? this was not the third week into it. And again, highest offers always come the first three to four weeks, right? So let's go back into this. And <clears throat> now we're in the third phase of marketing, which produced 90 people to the open house and the marketing produced 3,191 impressions. Now we had here 312 clicks on the listing. I also did Homes Pro 45 days. And by the way, this chart is not forward to the seller. This is a marketing cost that I absorb, right? Um, so I'm also active member of Homes Pro, which is this here. This is my dashboard. And this produced 34,344 views, which is included in here, right here. Then um, we also, so now we had a total open house result. We had three open houses. Technically, we had four, but really three officially. We had 67 people come to the open house. We had 21 realtors here um, tour the property with their respective clients. And this is with a super key system. So this is a key system that realtors only have. You have to have an account. I can see the realtor's name. I can see what time they went into the property, how much time they spent there when they locked up. And so the seller knew about this number. Right? We had, it's kind of like a system where you go direct usually to notify the agent. We did have one realtor in the beginning who did not lock up the property the right way left lights on seller was very upset about it said no more of this and so now i had to do it in a way where it's appointment only and so thanks a lot for that realtor because what i had to do is after every additional showing i had to go to afterwards to make sure everything's locked up and the lights are off so whoever this guy was or person was put a lot more work on, on to me but anyway that's part of the deal so we had 21 realtors come through here. So the seller knew about this number because either she had to be asked to vacate the premises or not to be there when the showings took place. We also did a YouTube video, which I think was very helpful. Is this one right here. This really uh, brought us 681 views. Uh, I have 3,200 subscribers. So this created a lot of momentum, a lot of excitement. People said, hey, I recognize you from the, uh, from the video, you know, because you're talking about the features of the place and explaining everything. So this is, I think, a very important uh, investment to make with any listing, really. So we had that. Then we have 18,000 social media followers. We posted almost every other day, weekly newsletters of pre-qualified buyers who expressed interest in buying in the near future. So 1,252, they were emailed weekly. Uh, Zillow was about 1,966 views and I think 300 saves. They have reset it since then. I don't know why they do that. And Redfin was similar, 1,452 views. Also, I think about 200 saves. I'm also an active member of the Real Estate Advisory Group which consists of 300 brokers and agents who each have a database of pre-qualified buyers. I don't know the stats, I just submitted twice. So now we have a total result of 67 people coming to open house, 21 realtors saw the uh, property with their clients, and we have a marketing result of 79,077 impressions. Now impression doesn't necessarily mean new people coming to the property, but let's say realtor John comes once and comes back again three times with their clients, that's four impressions, still not a bad marketing result. Now, uh, I want to mention that December 22nd, we took the property offline because um, there were more uh, listings coming on the market than I had expected in a similar price range. So I had more competition, right? So, and it was the holidays too, and I didn't want to waste my DOMs. I had 18 DOM stays on market at that time. So we took it offline, put it on hold um, 2000, uh, 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 December 22nd, and then resumed January 3rd. So now we're going forward to the open house and all that. Now we're 32 days into the listing. Now we're in the fifth week, right? We just left our prime time. 
and no offers. And so now it was time, a lot of inquiries, but no offers, a lot of people going through the property. And now it was time to have a meeting with the seller. So I sat down with the seller and said, Mr. Seller, are you prepared to own this property six months from now? And she says, no. I said, may I ask why? Well, usually I would rent the place out for $3,000 a month or so, or, or even if I don't live in it, which I can't right now, uh, it costs me eight or $900 a month with property taxes, HOA fees, and home show, homeless insurance, utilities, and cable. I said, okay. So then would it be fair to assume that if you own the property six months from now, that you would lose eight, $9,000, possibly even more if you calculate the loss of rent? She says, yes. I said, well, then we need to change our strategy. We can no longer insist on 555 or more because based on this sheet, and this is really what helped me uh, you know, relayed information. This was a very important sheet to because also the seller also said, you know, I really see that you do a lot of marketing. I see it all over the place in LinkedIn and YouTube and whatever, right? So she recognized the marketing efforts. And so based on this sheet, this allowed me to uh, have the seller rethink her position and, and her pricing strategy, right? And become more flexible. So now I had a different set of tools to my disposal. You know, so also what I did is I forgot to mention, I also did something that's called reverse prospecting. So in the MLS, I can see how many agents have sent my listing to how many of their clients. Like here is, for example, uh, Eva sent it to 80, Crystal Williams to 114. So this is 149 agents that came to my listing and forwarded to their clients. Right. So what I did is I created an email, body text. <clears throat> Thank you for expressing interest in my listing. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer it. Or if you would like a private showing, I'd be glad to set it up. So I copy pasted that, but I individualized each email with dear Luzine, dear Christine, dear Caesar, dear Barbara, you know, I want to make it more, more um, personal. That produced some results. We had some people come forward, you know, but now 32 days into it, so all of a sudden an agent comes in um, and she, she, by the way, she was amazing to work with. Oh my gosh. One year in the business, very fast responder, really both of us, it was like a symphony of a, of a transaction. We both was, were just on top of it because there's a lot of timelines, uh, deadlines to uh, to keep up, right? So she was great. <clears throat> so she says to me, would your seller be interested in an offer of five hundred forty thousand? And I said, well, here's the thing. The seller was really looking for something closer to 555000 right? The listing price. But would your buyer be able to submit an offer at 545000 and then she says, well, there's something I need to tell you is there's a unit in the building, same size, that was just appraised at 540000 I said, yes, I'm aware of that unit. This is unit 15. And Manny, I talked to Manny, the realtor, very nice guy. And the difference, though, is even though they're similar size, very close, th that 15 has two bedrooms, three bathrooms. My listing has two bedrooms, four bathrooms, and a bonus room in the garage, right? So I would imagine that the appraiser would see this as an additional value. So here's my suggestion. Can you ask your buyer to submit an offer at 545000 And if the appraisal comes in lower, we deal with it then. Sounds fair? Fair. So she submitted an offer at 545. So now we're on the contract. Now, again, this video is about, you know, how to, how overpricing can actually make, have you lose money, right? This is not a fifth week. So um, now going back to the realtor and her son, remember, uh, they were going to make a full price offer at 555000 minus the buyer's closing cost, which is 7000 So that's 548 Now we have a $3,000 discrepancy. Now, something I need to mention is that the buyer, the current buyers, did not request any buyer's credits because the inspector went through, didn't find anything. And again, the seller put this place in sparkling condition. She's a prominent visual artist, so she put a lot of extra touches in there. Even at the open house, she says, I want everybody to wear booties or shoes off and no dirty hands on the walls. And of course, we had smears on the walls, which she fixed, you know, but uh, it's just, just very particular about that, right? So so now, you know, that would be a $3,000 loss, you know, because we don't know if the realtor and her son would have asked for buyer's credits. Maybe they would have found something or nitpicked something and would have found something. Let's assume that did not, then it would be a $3,000 loss. And this is the point I'm trying to make, you know, always be careful not to overprice the property because you're wasting that prime time. Quickly, something I want to show you real quick as well is this article here. And that's another thing too is really quick, I want to say, um, 
one way to avoid the trap of overpricing is to hire an appraiser and get an appraisal for your property. That would be probably the most accurate way to do it. You know, they do it for the banks, they do it for the financial institutions, so they take it really seriously if you have a good appraiser, but most of them are really, really good. Anyway, so let's look at this real quick here. I want to share this with Forbes. You know, so here it says, thinking about overpricing your home, you are playing Russian roulette. As a homeowner, there's no doubt that you lovingly maintained the home, both for yourself and as you consider resale value. And now that you're about to actually sell the home, it is understandable that you want to be compensated for your efforts. Your home also holds a lot of memories. And if you're not careful, you'll end up projecting your sentiment and value into the home's selling price. This is huge. This is the second reason I was talking about earlier in the video, the second reason why homeowners overpriced their property. Now, you know, there is there is one thing I sat down with my seller to at some point, and I said, um, do you know the difference between a home and a house? What I mean is a home is a place where you create a lot of memories. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears invested in remodeling and decorating the place and painting and making it look like really nice. You know, it's your home. But when you leave and all your things are gone, it's a house. The buyer sees it as a house with four walls and a roof, and that's it. And that's how the market sees it too. And so... In my opinion, it is a detrimental, huge mistake to incorporate your sentimental value to your, your, your emotional attachment to the property into your pricing strategy, just as much as it is a big mistake, in my opinion, to incorporate the little estimate into your pricing strategy because it could backfire so much. Some agents have told me that people have told tens of thousands of dollars because they were way back two, three months down, had to take the lowest offer. And here's the thing, you know, if you're as a seller, if you sell a property, you have to make plans, you know, where you're going to go. You're moving out of state, you're relocating to another area, neighborhood, or buying another property, whatever the plan is. And all these plans fall apart if your property expires and sellers get very upset about that. You know, then now the next question is, I'm going to wrap it up with this. This is the last article I'm going to show you. The next question would be, um, why would agents take an overpriced listing, right? So one would be that it takes a lot of courage in listing uh, appointments to tell the seller, I'm sorry, Mr. Seller, it will not sell at this price, right? Because you may not get the listing. As a matter of fact, this happened to me two years ago. I went on a, went on a listing appointment in Santa Monica. It was a 5,000 square foot house, north of Montana, beautiful place, beautiful area. And the, the property was valued at 3.8, 3.9 based on my research, right? And the seller wanted to sell it for 4.9. Obviously, I didn't get the listing because I said to the seller, I might not get the listing by telling you the truth. But based on the data I provided for you on your the research, similar price, similar size properties in the neighborhood, the uh, market will not support a $4.9 million price tag. I didn't get the listing, but I kept an eye on it. So the last two years, he had four realtors, which each a six-month contract trying to sell it. It still hasn't sold, right? So... And again, why would that be? So here's one of the reasons. One would be that, you know, at the listing appointment, they don't have the courage to say it. And I'm not knocking any agent. Agents should do whatever they want, whatever works for them. Maybe one day I'll do it the same way. But here's the thing. This is an interesting article I found. Uh, let's see here. Why real estate agents take overpriced listings? Free advertising. This is one of them here. And again, this is not my opinion. This is an article I found that's uh, relatable to this whole video. Finding buyers through listings. Overpriced real estate listings enable agents to find new buyers who might be potential clients. There are different ways in which agents can find buyers. Sign calls. If a buyer wants to find out the price of a home, typically they will call the agent's cell phone number and ask. Agents who are on the ball will try to recruit that buyer to work with them as long as they're not already working with the agent because that's against uh, the property real estate rules. Open houses. Agents can hold an open house and find buyers that way as well. If buyers are not interested in the home, and they will not be once they find out the price. Remember, we're talking about an overpriced property. The agent is free to show the buyers other homes in that price range. Or newspaper and advertisement. An agent with an overpriced listing often will not put the address in the paper, but will list the details along with the price. That way, buyers who can afford to pay that amount will call to inquire. Now, all an agent has to do is suggest other homes in a particular price range that are worthwhile. Again, it's not really my um, way to do it. Overpricing is a mistake, you know, and uh, I think I talked about earlier, why would Zillow error on the upper side? Well, because they have an agent referral system, you know, so. But also when you sit uh, in a listing apartment, let's say there's a million dollar house, it's worth a million dollars and the seller wants to sell it for 1.2. Yes, of course, you could say, sure, just sign the listing agreement, bring it, it's sold, no problem. You know, this is common. And then a month or two down the road, there's no offers coming in. Then you have to tell the seller, I'm sorry, Mr. Seller, we have to lower the price. But you told me you're going to sell it for this price. So it's just an area that is a bit 
can get a bit nasty and uncomfortable and not a good idea. But anyway, um, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any questions, please call me at 310-918-2260. My number is at the bottom of the screen. Or you can go to shadelrealtor.com for more uh, useful links and information about me. Also on YouTube, you can find me at Philip A. Shadler. And if you could give me your opinion about this, I would really be interested what you think about this particular subject of overpricing agents or clients alike. And again, if you need any, or if you would like a home evaluation for free, my number is uh, just on the screen. Call me anytime. In the meantime, thank you. And if you could like and comment and forward this video, distribute it, this would really help me with my YouTube uh, algorithm. Thanks again. And until next time.